God will supply our needs. What are some that we have tonight? To be reminded of what's most important and to decide to stay faithful to it. There are a lot of key words, but our focused word is commitment. Commitment. Is God completing his work in you? Well, I don't know. What is it? Are you committed to his work no matter what? That's a good question. If you don't know what it is, how do you know if you're faithful to it? As you know, this earth is not heaven, but Christians are citizens of heaven while temporarily traveling through this sinful, dark land. And God's light of truth guides us. It's vital to always see and let others see and that light reflecting off of us that they can be attracted to God's light of truth. Why? Because the truth of the gospel saves. That truly is most important. The truth of the gospel saves. And with that being the case, blessings come with that. We are so blessed to know the sovereign God who promises eternity with him. If all spiritual blessings are in Christ, including eternal joy and life, I must be in Christ and must be faithful to that mission. And I must trust that God will complete that work. This lesson will sharpen your spiritual vision and encourage you to persevere. The key word is commitment. God will complete his work. And a lot of times people don't start what they don't believe that they will actually finish. If they have doubts they will finish, they may not even start something. Many people cr treat Christianity the same way. They'll say things like, I, it just looks too hard. <laughs> As if it's by your own strength always. Someone like me, Pah, you don't know my past, I could never change my ways. I'm not good enough, I can't be perfect all the time. Is that the perspective that someone has? It might all as well already be over for me. Why even bother? And so, so many people are so close, and they come so close to salvation, but they stay lost in condemnation because of, of um, maybe a misperception of what it means to follow Christ or just a lack of commitment from the beginning. So... The others have tasted the heavenly gift. And this is what hurts me the most. They've tasted the heavenly gift and there's no other hope. And yet they turn away from their only hope. Whether they drop out, burn out, or fizzle out, they cease to endure. And they begin to feel like the race is too hard, maybe not worth the effort. They lose sight of the goal. They take their eyes off the coach and the prize and the finish line. And some just fail to join because of a misconception of the Christian life, or they drop out because of it. Well, the real problem may or may not be whether a person is weak or lacks self-discipline, but it could very well be that they have simply forgotten or never been taught what it means to be God's workmanship. You know, this is the end of 2020, and we began the year with a few lessons on that subject of Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, those are some passages I want you to study this evening or through the rest of this week for review of this class, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And it could simply be that you don't know what it means to be <laughs> God's workmanship and the assurance that God will complete His work. That is so encouraging. That's what I need to hear all the time. That's what I'm reminding myself of and being blessed in the process. Christians are the master sculptor's work in progress so long as you're committed that work of God cannot be thwarted Philippians 1 6 Paul says I'm sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ and that's the key the day of Jesus Christ the ultimate completion no doubt we can learn a lot from this. Some people suggest that it refers to Paul's evangelistic work and his participation with the Philippian brethren there. Okay, that's fine. But it references the Day of Judgment. So this good work, this is a good work, whatever's being referenced, that prepares them for that Day of Judgment and Blessing. What is preparing us for that day? Philippians 1, verse 10. Uh, well, in chapter 2, verse 16, are good pair-up verses. This good work can be carried right up to the day that the Lord can or will return. And the reason the Philippian letter is one of joy and happiness is because it is filled with encouragement. 
And I like encouragement. That's why I stay in the Word. Chapter 1, verse 6 is true. We will make it. Not by our righteousness. We will make it to heaven upon being with the presence of the Lord. We will make it to that beautiful spot where we are transfigured into His likeness. Not by our wisdom or strength, but by His grace, His strength, His glory, and our faith in Him. We will make it because God is able to bring His work to completion. That's why I'm on His side. He's sovereign. So what is God's good work? Let's clarify this. Just in case we need to. What is God's good work? Philippians 1, 9 through 11 demonstrates six things. And I notice a, there's a glitch on the screen, but that's okay. Uh, demonstrates a few things that God is working on in them, and we can apply that to us. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent. I know what's good, and, and I can see it. Be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness. Oh, I want that. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. There's your full satisfaction. To the glory and the praise of God. So remember what life's all about. Remember truly what is most important. Those who have been completed will certainly... <laughs> be in heaven in this way. But while we're living, understand this. God is not simply working on getting us to heaven. You can make a, lessons that emphasize that. Totally scriptural, that's fine. But what is God's work? God is working on us to abound in love, better knowledge and discernment, to approve what is excellent, to see and participate in right holy things, to pursue purity and blamelessness, and to produce the fruit of righteousness, all to the glory and praise of God. Now, if that's the work of God, if I commit to it, He can make sure it will come about. Surprisingly, some people don't want God to work on them in this way. They would prefer to just check off a list of compliances to rules, and, and only maybe to the extent that they think that God will overlook some areas of their lives where they have willful unrighteousness. But there's more to the work of God than just following routines that are produced from a good heart, but if not from a good heart, are not obeyed. What is God's work in this? Well, God's work is not about doing, uh, getting you to heaven without developing your character. So God's workmanship is about changing us growing us, lifting us up out of the mire of sin that we so willingly entrenched ourselves in. The question, and it is a question we have to ask ourselves, even though a Wednesday night group is a good group of people, right? We wonder, have we asked and answered the question, do we want God to help us in these five plus ways? <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good question. And if the answer is no, then there is no work of God for you. There is, but it, it, there's no direction that you're going for that purpose. But if you do want God to develop you in these ways, God can work on you and complete it. Wow. And I want that. God will complete His work. But how? Christians who have, I said, long desired speedy development in these six ways uh, often are quite saddened or stressed by their shortcomings. I want growth and I want it now. It's like I want patience and I want it now. Huh. Well, if you have as a vision where you need to be, if you look to Christ a lot, then yeah, you're striving all the time. But don't, take your, don't forget how far you've come. The idea of don't look back is about don't turn back. Look to Christ and be thankful for how much He has blessed your life. Patience. It's easy to be tempted to give up. Don't. Don't put your faith in yourself. Put it in God. He will complete that work. Letter B, consider some of the following verses. I was greatly encouraged by these today. You'll recognize most, all of them, really. So, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. God will complete the good work he has begun. Philippians 1, 28b. In the context here, 
when the, when the lost mock your uprightness, when the lost mock your uprightness, that is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but to you of salvation and that from God. That's a, it's a terrible feeling, but it's a good reassurance to know I have salvation from the Lord. The Lord. Philippians 4.19, this is our text for the whole series. And my God will supply every need of yours according to the riches of in glory in Christ Jesus. Let this soak in, please. This, you in Christ, faithful to the end all the way, will have an eternity in heaven. Wow. That's beautiful. And then Philippians 4.19 Yes, the bonus devotional is God will provide all we need for His work in us. God will provide all He needs. He wants us to win. He wants us to make it happen in our lives. And He provides all that we need to make it happen Himself. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior. That's the emphasis point. The Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. God is sovereign. The Lord Jesus will transform our lowly bodies. He has that power over death because He's the Lord of life. I have confidence in that. Therefore, I have commitment to the end. Letter C, so just an emphasis, don't give up, don't quit, don't back down. Why? Because, not because you're smarter or stronger than you think. That's not why we don't uh, drop out, <laughs> or that, that's not, not why we continue. But frankly, because it's God working in you, and He will complete His work. Put your faith in His work, not yours. All right. Section 3 on the outline is... Just a few examples of God completing his work to encourage you and kind of uh, gear our minds towards how God may be working in your life. Obviously, Jesus Christ. We spent this whole year of Sunday morning class series showing how God has, has completed his work in Christ. Philippians 2 is the humble passage. Uh, the great humility of Jesus leaving the glories of heaven. He left behind all that radiance and obvious glory to be the one to come down to live as a human being and die for us. At that point, it... It looked like God's work wasn't <laughs> taking place. It looked like evil was overthrowing the plan of God. Rather than being seated on a throne, Jesus was nailed to a cross. How many people looking at that scene believed that God's work had failed? Look through the eyes of his disciples. But what actually was happening at that scene? God completed his work. Jesus was exalted in his resurrection and in his ascension and enthronement. He was exalted. He is now sitting at the right hand of God, reigning in heaven. God will complete his work. And he has that mission or purpose for you. Never let anything, not even the world, shake you off that path that God has for you. An illustration as well is the Philippians, Paul's partnership with them. Philippians chapter 2, 25 through 30 is a great passage to read on your own time. And, and this, uh, the Philippians had commissioned Epaphroditus to take a gift to Paul and support him. But however, because of his journey, he became sick near to the point of death, near it. <laughs> and it looked like God's work was not going to take place. However, God had mercy on Epaphroditus, the Philippians, and Paul. He healed Epaphroditus and was, quote, able to complete what was lacking in the Philippians' service to Paul. God completes his work. That was a beautiful scene there. Letter C, let's reference this a, a little bit later, but we see God completing his work in Paul himself. Paul himself. Oh, I love to study that, about that man. We see his growth in the succession of the letters that he wrote. Philippians 4. While in prison, Paul illustrates sin. Um, and I'm going re to reference back Romans chapter 7 for you. Romans chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Uh, he references covetousness as something he apparently struggles with. We can ensue, I mean, we all do to a degree, but covetousness. Okay, you're always wanting something else. <laughs> By the time Paul writes Philippians, he's able to say, I have learned, I'm going to emphasize that word this time, I've learned in whatever situation, to be content. Different translations are different, I know, but 
He says, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and being hungry, of abundance and need. That's the ESV. The man was once so plagued with covetousness that he cried out, who will deliver me from this body of death? And I know in that phrase, everything was all inclusive. But that was one of the sins, and yet he's now able to say, I've learned how to be content no matter what. That's a priceless lesson. Priceless. God has been working on Paul, and God completed his work in Paul. Paul stood for righteousness. That made it challenging in a world of unrighteousness, but therefore God also held him up, didn't he? The doomed deceiver, who is Satan, has no good intent for you, and he will do whatever he can to sway you from the path of salvation. From Paul's letter here to the Philippians, we can ascertain some of his attacks. And let's just notice a few of them. How does Satan try to beat you up when you're already down and make you want to quit? Well, I want to encourage you, brace yourself for these times of testing lest you go astray and abandon God. Letter B, suffering. Suffering. Some things aren't necessarily evil, inherently evil, but... They can be brought about by sin, sometimes just attacks from the spiritual warfare. And Philippians 1, 29 and 30, talks about, Paul talks about the suffering that both he and they were going through. We don't know the full extent, but we can gather or surmise that it was apparently persecution-driven. And Paul suffers his imprisonment all that way and all that went with it. Interesting. And he writes this letter of joy and encouragement to us while there. God completes his work. Also, distress. The Philippians heard about Epaphroditus' illness and they were distressed. Paul wants to ease their distress. What are some causes of distress? Uh, I want to open it up for discussion, but then no one online would hear you. But that's all right. You're thinking it with me, please. What are some causes? I listed a few. People get sick. Accidents happen. Even death. It can only be prolonged, postponed uh, sometimes. Financial, relational trouble, health, spiritual trouble, family trouble, uh, burdens and cares of things that matter to you. Uh, I typed it this way. Types of distress that we're talking of here, of how Satan uses it, is an anxiety caused when normal life circumstances unfavorably shift. And that's a good definition. Wrote that, just uh, found that somewhere. The... Um, it may be distress about something in your own life or someone else's. Satan then wants us to believe, be careful about this, that, well, life should be stress and distress less or free, that if, if we are going through distress, God must have abandoned us. We might as well then abandon him. How does he get us to that point? We'll explain it in just a moment. So hold on to that question. But here's a quote for you that's, uh, worth uh, focusing on. It's better uh, to suffer momentary distress from a circumstance than to live in distress as a condemned condition. I must never abandon God. There's no choice in the matter. It's the only right way, and I don't want to live without Him. So I trust Him. And God's working on me all the time. Letter D, Paul talks about this confidence in, uh, that many put in the flesh. Confidence in the flesh. And in chapter 3, 2 through 11, a lot of verses there that this applied mainly to those who were keeping the Old Testament law and the requirements like such as circumcision of the flesh. But, however, you and I today can fall prey to the same thing when we, and I'll just say it this way, falling prey to this attack where we rely on these things that we think we can do. Are those, those who uh, fall prey to this, are those who put their trust in their own ability and strength to keep any legal or perceived legal requirement from God. Righteous ritual, we would say. This attack by the devil to help encourage us to abandon God is so subtle that those primarily f um, focused on their own abilities start taking their eyes off of their dependence on God. We don't even know what's happening. We abandon God when we trust in ourselves. It's just that simple. And even those 
uh, who do so many good works can easily fall prey to being guilty of this as well because the focus is then on maybe what they can do and forget who even gave them those talents and skills to be enhanced. So let's not be like the Pharisee in Luke chapter 18. Our full focus needs to truly be on how awesome God is and how great our God is because he's the source of all hope, all strength, all life. And conversely, uh, instead of overly praising one's self, some tear themselves down. This is so interesting. Uh, they tear themselves down by their own imperfections. Imperfection. This is another attack. The devil, if he can get you this way, he'll do it. <laughs> Uh, I know he, he tempts me with this quite a bit. <laughs> but Paul shares a shocking point in Philippians 3.12, and I'll just reword it. Uh, no Christian, however long they've lived on this earth, ever becomes a perfect duplicate of Christ's likeness. That's one way of saying no Christian is perfect, right? We're striving to be more like him. If Paul were here and I were to ask the question, how many of you are not yet perfect? And how many of us still stumble over some new or old sin, he'd raise his hand just like the rest of us could and should. Uh, in this verse, um, Paul indicates imperfection might be a reason that some people quit, but he keeps pressing on because we are growing. When we struggle and stumble, Satan goes further to beat us up when we're down, but he'll encourage us to say things like this. You may have had these thoughts to yourself, I don't know. See, I told you you couldn't do it. You might as well give up. Persevering is its own success. I remember saying that one time, and that was uh, appreciated in a class. Perseverance is its own success. So don't lose focus. God is giving us progressive victory over sin. That's your main goal in life, isn't it? That's encouraging. Let all things develop you. Strengthen. Mature. That's the key word. Letter F. If it's on there, yeah, oh yeah, of course it is. It just came up. Struggles with the brethren. Think about this. We're never, none of us have that perfection, right? <laughs> that perfect reflection of Christ in all areas. No way. But we're growing in different ways. Imperfections in our lives. Consider the inevitable trials when people congregate. Uh, Paul tells us about two sisters who were having some kind of a, a problem with each other, and Satan wants to get us frustrated with each other. And he'll take that further, and let's just jump to the gun. He'll get, take that further if he can. He will hope that that attribute also of their weaknesses carries over in our perception of Christ himself. So because of how the brethren treated me, I'll just quit Christ and simply no longer follow him. He's gotten a lot of people that way. Satan attacks in these ways. He attacks in many more. And, the, and Paul knew that the Philippians had struggles, had challenges. They might question the working of God in this. And, and that's not good. You've got to have faith in the work of God so that you persevere in it when things are tough and challenging. And still, Paul claimed that God is completing his work. No matter all these things that he listed, Paul still was encouraging them to stay faithful because God is working. And I, I think that's a beautiful, beautiful truth all the time. The fifth section of our class is about what God does to complete his work in us. This is weird <laughs> or impressive. God uses negative circumstances. The things that he allows, he does and can bring that about to good to his children. God uses negative circumstances to complete his work. If we were in prison like Paul, I wonder how many of us would have felt like that situation indicated that God wasn't working. But Paul addressed, and he said it, it's actually helping the spreading of the gospel. Not only is Paul talking to his guards that are you know, chained to him all the time or around him in the household. No, no, he, they're hearing the gospel. But also the brethren are more bold in their speaking of the truth. God will complete his work. It's a beautiful perspective Paul has. Well... He does mention in verses 15 through 18 in chapter 1 that enemies are, are there. God uses even enemies to complete his work. Uh, they may not have good intent and they may be sinning on their record, but God can use even that to accomplish his will. Only God is so holy and righteous that even he can, and I like this word, overwhelm the plots of the wicked. He can frustrate them. Uh, that's amazing that he can do that. If it's 
suits his will, that they will not succeed against God's will. We see that in the Old Testament all the time. Paul talks about people who were uh, teaching about Christ, but they weren't doing it out of the right spirit. They weren't doing it to pro really promote Christ, maybe just to make Paul look bad. We could talk a lot about that. That's a fun subject to discuss. But they were essentially becoming enemies of Christ according to, but for as far as they're concerned, because their efforts were not good intent, maybe to make Paul look bad as well. But Paul did not see this attack on him or his, this mockery of Christ's love and teaching as a sign that God wasn't working. Rather, Paul saw how God was using even these enemies of him to complete the work that Paul has committed to. It was going to at least bless the listeners. Paul wanted to preach to them. Well, he may not be able to directly, but others are doing the same thing. That's good. Let us see. God makes sure the people we need are around us. This is from verses 19 through 26 of chapter 1. And, and this is one where I would love to spend about 10 minutes just studying and focusing on so you can enjoy the deductive thought, or well, I should say the inductive reason that led to this deductive teaching and thought. Here we go. Don't miss the importance of these verses in the context of God completing his work. Paul was certain that he would be delivered. One way or another, somehow or another, he was certain of it. Why? How? Not because he was arrogant and thinking that people needed him, but because he was sure the Philippians needed him, needed the blessing from his work. This is an amazing idea where if you're so in tune with God's will and trusting him fully, God will make sure the necessary people are around us, whether that's through you or not. He had faith that God would work it out. But this is certainly also seen in chapter 2, 25, where God spared Epaphroditus as well. So this is just a nice little episode, um, uh, a clip of what we see God's working really is. Letter D, God provides the necessary sacrifice. Now, chapter 2 obviously reminds us of the sacrifice of Christ. God completed his work in Jesus, even in negative circumstances, at the hand of his enemies. But the reminder is this. If God would sacrifice his son so that he could work in us, how much more will he do whatever it takes to complete his work in us? To complete his work in us. He wouldn't go to all that effort just to leave his committed children abandoned. I need to stay faithful to him. Committed. God will transform us. Chapter 3, 20 and 21. Paul reminds us what's coming. I did earlier at the beginning of the class. Yes, it's important now to walk, but where are we walking towards? We are walking towards heaven. And God's preparing us for that. He is. He's developing us as we go, and it's going to happen. We need to think beyond what's right now and remember the promise of God at the end of earth and our experience of it. While our spirits are being matured daily, these lowly bodies will be like his glorious body. Looking forward to that. Letter F. God will guard us. God will guard us by what? His peace and his presence. Chapter 4, 4 through 9. Here Paul talks about prayer. He talks about mental focus. Uh, as we surrender to God with proper thinking, his unfathomable peace is, is blessing us. It guards our hearts. And here's a quote. I think I did include this uh, on the next slide. Yes, okay. One person said it this way. God will send a troop of soldiers to stand guard over the citadel of our hearts removing the anxiety, distress, and struggle that so want to attack. And that's beautiful. Circumstances don't change, but within your heart, that's a condition that's priceless. And I have already prayed for you along this line, as well as me. God will teach us how to live His way. And that comes back down to what it's all about. Chapter 4, 11, and 12... Paul makes a subtle statement, and this is where textual studies really come into play. I'd like to teach that way more often, but um, it, if you're really not into it, textual teach well, I won't say that, never mind. It, if you really get into it, textual studies are great. Uh, Paul makes a subtle statement twice. Notice Paul says he learned contentment. He was taught. If he learned something, he was taught. How was he taught? And who allowed it? Who did it? Who was responsible? Who gets the credit? Who gets the glory for the right choices made? In it? I mean, just ask yourself all these kind of questions. Say, ah, God taught him this. 
God taught him contentment. And I think of Paul's own words in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, in which he claimed, The grace of God trains us up to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. When you think of what he wrote to Titus there, and then go back to Philippians 4, you're thinking, Oh, Paul, I feel like I'm closer to you now. Paul learned this priceless lesson by the grace of God's instruction. And through our providence, well, through God's uh, allowed providential experiences for our lives, God will teach us, God will train us to live His way. God will complete His work. It's beautiful. God will strengthen us. God will strengthen us. Life's filled with challenges, and I love the passage, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me when properly understood. Uh, when circumstances are beyond what you thought you could bear alone, rejoice deep down that God is strengthening you even then to do what you thought you couldn't otherwise. God be the glory. You choose to commit and stay faithful, but to God be the glory. He's helping you. That may sometimes simply mean staying faithful, trusting in that providential next step. Um, I'll type this. When we all, let's see, when all we are cannot sustain us or ourselves, we then learn that he will carry us through. And then I think that's a good thing, to go through those experiences where we truly have to depend upon God or else we wouldn't understand what that really means. He strengthens us. Letter I, God will supply every need. He will supply every need. And there's that passage, chapter 4, 18 through 19. Again, Paul brings up Epaphroditus. Uh, just as God made sure that Paul was fully supplied for his work, Paul explained that God would also provide for the Philippians all that they needed. And I referenced 2 Peter 1, 3. What has he done for us? God has given us all things. And I love the song that is made from that verse. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. God wants us to make it. He wants us to surround his throne eternally. He wants us all uh, to have, he wants us, he will give us all we need to make that happen if we are willing. The question is, do we really believe in God? If we don't, then we've negated all of God's past proof and neglect all of his encouragement for that this letter offers. Let's not believe the father of lies. Let's believe the father of glory. So what must we do? We've been focusing on what God does. We have to conclude the class ever so briefly with what we do. Yeah, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. The concept of living out, working out our salvation that's been given to us. I'm looking at what's most important to share as I knew time would get about like this. We're doing good. Mm, amid ever-shifting and ever-present imperfections, he was going to keep pressing on. So here's what we do. We, verse 27, live worthy of the gospel. Live worthy. Let your conduct bring honor and glory to it. Let it be complimentary, beneficial to the good news of salvation. Some people, by the way they live, you think, I know the message of the gospel and I see how they live and there is an inconsistency there. Don't be like that. <laughs> let's be walking that path. Ch let's see, letter C, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Count others more significant than yourselves. That relational strife mentioned certainly tempts us to quit. But we strive for deeper unity, don't we? Among the congregation and every brethren, we know God will complete his work. When it seems impossible for us, we know that God can work it out as we work on it. <laughs> Letter D, don't grumble or complain. That doesn't mean ignore legitimate concerns. That's not what we're talking about. The spirit of complaining, that's a sin. You know that distinction. Philippians 2.14, uh, instead of just going through the motions and think that's it, we're told to be cheerful servants. That's not always easy, and we pray for God to help us in this. You're committed to the work. That's good, but work on this as well every time to truly be appreciative of the work, and I thank God for the ability that you've given me to work here to have what I call meaningful work to focus on. Uh, that's good for me. Uh, letter E, hold fast to the word of life. We can't live what we don't know. Prioritize the study of Scripture. Learn it and be led by it. Letter F, Count everything else as loss. What's most important? Paul wanted, us, Paul wanted himself to know the power of his resurrection so badly that he, he would not let anything get in the way or slow him down. He would cast off anything so that he could run that race most effectively. And God is accomplishing his work in us that way. Letter G, 
Watch those who are good examples. I, I really want to stress this. Uh, it's worth the time. Don't be envious of the brethren who are more effectively living out some other aspect of Christianity that you also need to be maturing in. Let's be careful about that. We're all growing in different ways, but Paul would instruct us to appreciate those examples and learn from them. And that's a beautiful picture of camaraderie and shared unity, isn't it? Uh, stand firm, letter H, stand firm in the Lord. He's the only firm foundation there is. Letter I, chapter 4 and 6, prayer. Combat anxiety through gratitude filled with prayer. It's amazing what that will do. The blessings don't come until you do. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. When you feel ashamed or scared or doubtful that you'll make it, just don't quit. When you mess up very badly, I want you to rejoice that godly repentance truly welcomes God's forgiveness. That's beautiful. And then in a conclusion, that was a lot of words. You may have run out of ink. You may have to buy some new pens. Conclusion. It's good to link up these two verses, or these two pair, uh, passages. Paul was absolutely convinced that if he were to die, right then, right there, he would be with God. Hmm. Hmm. It's almost like saying, God's got this, I'm good. He knew God was working on him and would complete his work in this life and in the next. I'll leave Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 on the screen for you to read on your own time. And it's a beautiful passage letting you know to keep pressing on. Never, never, never give up. I do hope this lesson has been a blessing to you. It has sure blessed my past three days. And the truth, hopefully being reminded, will last a lifetime.